1 John chapter 3, we'll read verses 1 and 2 this morning, focusing on verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, hear now the inspired word of God. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared, it, is not ha it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. Let's pray. Father, once again as we prepare to look into your word, we're talking about Jesus. And Father, we pray that you would guide us into truth, that there'd be no error, and that we would understand what you have to say to us. And that understanding what you say to us, that we would become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Please. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned a 1950s game show called To Tell the Truth. And if you remember, it's, it was a, a show that had a panel of four celebrities. And they were presented with the story of someone who had accomplished something newsworthy. They were introduced to three individuals, all who claimed to be this famous or infamous person. And by asking questions, they were to guess the real person's identity. Well, one of the most interesting guests on that show was a man named Frank Abagnale. I see some of you remember the name. Mr. Abagnale was a forger, a grifter, a thief, and a professional imposter. According to the movie based on his life, he successfully posed as an airline pilot so he could ride free of charge never had piloted a plane in his life. He posed as a doctor and ran a clinic in a hospital with no medical background whatsoever. He became a lawyer and successfully passed the bar exam without ever having gone to law school and actually obtained a position as a prosecutor in a southern state's attorney's office. But it was his ability as a master forger that put him in the the crosshairs of the government. He was eventually caught, made a deal with the government, and helped them to identify forgeries and worked with various governmental law enforcement agencies for a number of years. When he finishes his obligation to the government, he opened his own security firm. I just find that amazing. And he became well known as this security consultant throughout the, not only the United States, but throughout the world. I think it's fair to say that he was one of the best, the best imposters that this nation has ever seen. But he's not the only imposter. The world is full of imposters. People claiming to be someone that they are not. That was the Apostle John's concern back in the first century. Imposters had come into the church, were disrupting the unity and the fellowship of the body of Christ. We've seen that we, he, he focused on the Gnostics in this particular epistle, but Judaizers were also a problem, as, as were various other heresies that had snuck into the church. Remember, those are some of the reasons why John actually writes this epistle in the first place. But there's another danger that the church must be aware of. And it's much more subtle than even imposters sneaking into the church. And what I'm talking about is the fact that true Christians very often not know who they are in Jesus Christ. Remember, we've already seen how a lack of assurance of salvation hinders the mission of the church. We've seen that in the first couple chapters. 
It affects the fellowship of the church. It affects the unity of the church. So John writes his letter for the very reason that he wants Christians to know who they are. Remember in chapter 5, verse 13, these things I have written to you, says John, who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And as you become more assured, it affects not only your spiritual condition, but your attitude as well. We saw in the very beginning of the epistle, in chapter 1, verse 4, John says, these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Knowing that you have eternal life is extremely important. As you reflect on your salvation, your eternal life, don't forget something very important. What does that mean in the here and now? Too many Christians don't understand what being a child of God means in this life. In fact, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the leading theologians of the mid-20th century, said, I do feel that this is perhaps the greatest weakness of all in the Christian church, that we fail to realize what we are or who we are. And that brings us to our text for today, verse 2 of the third chapter of the epistle of 1 John. John writes, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. This is one of the clearest and yet most profound verses in all of the Bible. Is it not true that the church of Jesus Christ today is full of unhappiness, discontentment, and complaints? Just ask any pastor who's doing any amount of counseling. In other words, what I'm saying is if you look at your circumstances, if you look at the things that are happening to you without understanding who you are, without understanding what your calling means, then yes, you will be unhappy, discontented, com and complain about your lot in life. Here's what I mean by that. The predominant way the gospel is presented in America today is this. As a child of God, you deserve health, wealth, and prosperity. In other words, it's been summed up very adequately by, well, you know, you deserve your best life now. If you buy into that philosophy and believe that God has promised you that kind of life and you don't get it, then of course you will be discontent, you'll be subject to complaining, and even lapsing into depression. But let me say this as clearly as I can. Those are lies. They are promises of men, not promises of God. God never promises the Christian a carefree life. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world... You have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And just a chapter earlier, in chapter 15, verse 18 of John's gospel, Jesus said this, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. And Paul, giving some excellent pastoral advice to a young pastor, Timothy, in chapter 3 of his second epistle, verse 12, the Apostle Paul says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The promise of God is not to remove you from the trouble from your life, but to carry you through it. And, and what is the greatest comfort that you can receive when you're going through the trouble? Knowing who you are in Jesus Christ.
Remember, that's the theme of this entire epistle. John wrote five chapters, a whole book, on this very topic. And our text for this morning is right on point with encouragement and comfort based upon who you are. This verse gives us a series of positive statements meant to encourage and comfort you as you face the struggles of being a child of God, living in a world system that's hostile to you. And that's becoming more and more apparent. So what is the first point that John makes? Look at the first clause of our text. Beloved, now we are children of God. You have to realize, the moment you're born again, the moment you're given the gift of faith, the moment you repent of your sin, you become a child of God. This is a promise of God that is fulfilled instantly. John expressed this in the very first chapter of his gospel. Chapter 1, verse 12, he says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name. And then he adds some important points for another message. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now this may seem obvious, but it's too crucial a point to pass over without comment. If you are a Christian, then you are a child of God right now as you sit in these pews. And if you, this is not a promise that is deferred until you reach heaven. We know there are promises that we won't see until we reach heaven. But this is not one of them. You are a child of God now. We even addressed this last week that as a child of God, we share in a divine nature even now. And therefore, our lives should resemble and reflect the nature of our Savior and his holiness. See, the health, wealth, and prosperity people twist this to say that being a child of God means you should live like a member of the royal household. You should live a happy and a carefree life. Snap your fingers and you can have whatever the desires of your heart. But we know that the kingdom of God is not like earthly kingdoms. Jesus entered into glory after suffering and dying for his people. There's the biggest difference right there. Earthly kings go to war. What do they do? They send their people out. They sit back in the comfort of their throne room. Jesus Christ became man. And he died. He suffered for his people. In fact, theologians distinguish between the states of the person of Jesus Christ. They break it down into two basic categories, his humiliation and his exaltation. And to understand what John is referring to here, I think it's necessary to look first at, at the humiliation of Jesus since he is the first fruits of all who believe. His humiliation began with the incarnation. Imagine the eternal Christ, the word of God, the son of God, the second person of the Trinity, submitted himself to take upon him human flesh. That's an amazing, that's amazing right then and there. Paul details this in Philippians chapter 2. Speaking of Christ, he says, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, when you first read that, that seems unthinkable. Why would God do such a thing? But that's exactly what he did. 
And that was only the beginning taken upon himself human flesh. He submitted himself to human authorities, including his earthly mother and father. He was perfect. They were not. Then he endured the rejection of his own people. He was subject to ridicule, to slander, the object of lies. He was falsely arrested and charged with trumped up charges. He was convicted in an illegal and an immoral trial. He suffered a sinner's execution while he hung on a cross, bleeding, suffering an agonizing death, while insults were hurled at him, and he was mocked. Then he was buried in a tomb. And those are just the external humiliations that he suffered. We can only imagine the agony he was experiencing that caused him to pray to God. He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's so intense with the agony that he's enduring. He begins sweating profusely like drops of blood. And he prayed, is there any other way? The agony that he was going through that would cause him to pray such a prayer. But his prayer always ended, not my will, but thine be done. Through all of that, he was humble and meek. The prophet Isaiah had written centuries before, in 53 verse 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its sharers, so he did not open his mouth. And through all of these experiences, he never ceased being the son of God. The author of Hebrews would later write of him in chapter 12, verse 2. Speaking of Jesus, he said, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus understood his mission and his purpose on earth and would not let anything stand in his way. Scripture tells us he set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. What was that mission? What was the importance of that mission? He tells us in Luke 19.10, he said, for the Son of Man, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And he knew exactly what that meant, exactly what lay ahead of him, because Matthew records for us in chapter 16 of his gospel, Jesus speaking to his disciples. Matthew writes, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised up on the third day. He knew all of that in advance. And he set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. But remember, Jesus, his primary mission, to seek and to save that which was lost. But he also came to show us how we should live after him. Peter writes, in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 21. He says, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Jesus left us an example. How he lived his life are the qualities that we need to reflect. Remember, eternal life begins now. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are now a child of God. And, and we're not ignorant of what that means. Christ taught his disciples the the difference between earthly kingdoms and heavenly kingdoms. And they are diametrically opposed to one another. 
In chapter 10 of the Gospel of Mark, Mark writes in chapter 10, verse 42, Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be the slave of all. And then he says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And, and, and Paul gives us some instructions as well concerning how we are to live in this present world. We read earlier in Philippians 2, verses 6 to 8, concerning how Christ didn't, hesi didn't hesitate to humble himself. And he became a bondservant. But Paul begins that section with these words, have this attitude in, which, in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul exhorted the Philippians with these words in chapter 1, verse 29. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. It has been granted. That brings us to the second truth the Christian must be assured of. And it's crucial to keep this in mind, especially, especially when trouble comes your way. And difficulties come that you think are too great to handle. That truth is simply this. Remember, you are destined for glory. You're a child now, but you are destined for glory. There's a lot of speculation about heaven and the eternal state of mankind. Just go to any bookstore and see how many books have been written on it. Which makes it all the more interesting that John, who wrote the book on the revelation of Jesus Christ, and an apostle, says the details of the, of the eternal state, um, they haven't been revealed yet. Look at the second clause of chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. Hmm. We know that there will be a glorified state. Paul has made that abundantly clear to us. He made it clear in the epistle to the Romans. And in one of my favorite chapters in all of scripture, Romans chapter 8, that's my go-to chapter. Whenever I get down, I go to chapter 8. You want to know who you are in Christ? Go to Romans chapter 8. But to comfort those suffering distress, he writes this in verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's such a great verse. You're going through trouble? Have distress? God is going to use that for his glory and your good. But notice who that promise is for. That promise is only for those who are called according to his purpose. Remember, as a, as a child of God, you were bought by Christ, and therefore you have a heavenly purpose. And, and look how that purpose plays out in your life in verse 29, just following verse 28. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. In other words, you were called to become like Jesus. Let me be crystal clear. You weren't called because you are like Jesus. Amen. You were called to become like him, to be conformed to his image. That is one of your main purposes on earth. But then Paul gives us a summary of your salvation. These whom he predestined, this verse 30, these whom he predestined, he also called. These whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, 
he also glorified. While things make it tough for you while here on earth, keep this in mind. Wait a minute. Let me rephrase that. Not while things may. When things get tough for you, because they will. Suffering of one sort or another is a guarantee, as we saw earlier in Philippians 1. It has been granted for you to suffer. So when you find yourself suffering, remember this. Yes, you are a child of God now. But that means you are an heir to all the precious promises of God. All the promises that were made to Jesus Christ through his perfect obedience are yours. And so also keep in mind that glory awaits you at the end of time. Just a, a few quick side comments are here, I think, to avoid confusion. One of the topics we strive to keep in proper focus is the doctrine of last things, eschatology. And we've seen in various studies that every time we see the words the last days or the coming of Christ and others, those, it's not necessarily talking about one event. There's different contexts for those words to be used. We know for sure that Christ will come at the end of time in power and glory, and that will be Judgment Day. But we also know that those phrases were used to describe the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. But I am absolutely convinced that the present text, John is referring to the second coming at the end of time. And there is still much that has not been revealed about that great and glorious event. It is, however, an event that should encourage and comfort the believer. Judgment Day should hold no, no fear for the believer in Jesus Christ because Christ has paid the price for your sin. Amen. You are declared innocent, not guilty in God's court. The fine has been paid. So we look forward. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. While at the same time, it should be a terrifying thought to the non-Christian. Those are not my words. They come from Hebrews 10.31, where the author says, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a horrifying thought. Well, back to our text. John who knows some things about glory, says it has not yet been revealed what it will be like. And, and we need to understand, John is not ignorant of the glory and majesty of God. Remember, he was on the mountain when Jesus was transfigured before his very eyes. The glory of God was opened in some fashion to James and Peter and John as they saw Christ transfigured. In Matthew chapter 17, it's, we read in verse 2, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And then Moses and Elijah appear. And Peter wants to build tabernacles to, to commemorate this great event. And then we read in verse 5, while he was still speaking, this is Peter, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Amen. And notice what the reaction was when they saw the glory of God. In verse 6, we read, they fell face down to the ground and were terrified. The Apostle Paul, he knew something about the glory of God. Remember, before his conversion, remember who he was? Acts chapter 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. Whenever I read that, I think of a bull snorting, breathing threats. That's what the apostle Paul was like. And he went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, that is Christians, 
both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Paul was one of the greatest enemies of the church, and he is faced with the glory of the risen Christ. We read in verse 3, as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And what was his response? He fell to the ground, and he was blinded by the light. And then John, again, experienced something similar on the Isle of Patmos. That's why we read from the first chapter of Revelation this morning. And what was John's response when he sees the Christ? The Christ that he reclined on his chest at the Lord's Supper, the same person. When he sees him fully in all the glory of God, he fell at the Lord's feet like a dead man. But even with those glimpses, John says, we still don't know exactly what we will be like in glory. But we do know that entering our glory is assured. Why? Why? How can we have this assurance? Because Jesus has gone ahead of us to prepare the way for us. In that great section in John chapter 14, one of the Lord's last appearances before his crucifixion, and he's got the disciples together in a private room. And he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. I have a good friend who is King James only, and this is one of the verses. He, he loves this in the, in the King James. It says, in my Father's house are many mansions. It does sound more appealing, doesn't it? But he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And so we know that he has guaranteed our reaching this glorious place. And if you need any more assurance, going back to John chapter 6, verse 39, Jesus says, this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing. But I raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. And Paul confirms this same fact in Philippians 1.6, where he says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in, in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So your glorification is assured because it's part and parcel of the purpose of God. And God's purpose and plans cannot be thwarted by any being in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. And if that isn't enough, the Holy Spirit is actually given to you and indwells you as a pledge. That is a guarantee that you will be in glory. And further proof of that is your sonship, Christ being the firstborn and heir to all things, and we are joint heirs with him. As Paul says in eight, Romans 8, 15, for you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption by, as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God and of children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Paul, who was an apostle who was given special revelation, remember he was raised to the third heaven, had visions that he couldn't even, he couldn't even express. And he agrees that what's waiting for us on the other side is far greater than what we may have to endure here. He says in Romans 8, 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. 
For our last point, let's just focus on some positives for the short time we have left. We know that there is much that has not been revealed about the second coming. So what do we know for certain? First, we know this. Jesus is coming again. That's a fact. Just look at our text for today. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. We know when he appears, not if. The fact is, Christ is going to return. The only question is when. Second thing, we will see him. We will see and seeing him just as he is. There will be no veil between him and us. Remember, when Christ ascended into heaven, he was in the selfsame body in which he was crucified. And he is the God-man for all eternity. And when he returns, we will see him because he is still in that selfsame body. And we'll have that body for all eternity. We will see Jesus. And John tells us one more fact concerning his return. We will be like him. We will receive our glorified bodies and remain in them forever because we will be like him. We know this is true, firstly, of course, because it's in the scriptures and it is in the plan of God. And if you are called according to his purpose, then the promise of eternal life is yours here and now. But the glories of heaven await you. When he comes, it will be the culmination of history. The curse will be completely reversed. There will be new heavens, new earth. Paul gives us a mini chronology of those events. And these are things we can say for certain because they're in the word of God. After defending the reality of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul continues and writes this. He says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and the Father. When he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. What an amazing ending the Lord has promised for all those who believe. Getting back to our friend Frank Abagnal. He demonstrated on that show once again that he was the greatest con man of all time because he fooled all four celebrities. The scriptures warn us not to be taken in by false prophets numerous times. And the danger is real, so be on your guard. And the best guard you have against that is don't forget who you are. You are a child of Almighty God. You are joint heirs with Christ. You are destined for glory. And this is all part of the plan and purpose of God, so it will happen. So when you find yourself in trouble, remember... Remember that the glories that await you far outweigh the troubles you are experiencing here on earth. Remember when the apostles were arrested by the council and beaten and released. Remember what their attitude was. They were beaten and told never to preach the gospel again and released. And they went out rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, none of these promises are yours. Cry out to God, repent of your sin, call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And then these promises are for you. Let's pray.